Hello, I'm Paddy Delaney, and welcome to Integrated Infrastructure, a podcast dedicated to bringing you news and views from industry leaders involved in the development, design, construction, and management of the many built forms that make up Australia's integrated infrastructure. This is episode 19 of Integrated Infrastructure, and this week I welcome back John Davis to the podcast. John is the CEO of Australian Contractors Association, and when we last spoke, John promised to come back and talk to us about the framework for a sustainable industry that he was developing at the time. In this week's podcast, we talk about John's belief that COVID could be construction's uber moment, and the opportunity for digitalization and the use of lean construction methods. We discuss the incredibly negative stats that surround the industry, including the estimated 16 to $20 billion losses that contractors have absorbed over the last 10 years. We touch again on the need for change in the commercial agreements and the need to end the boom and bust pipeline. We move on and get into the framework for a sustainable industry and the fantastic opportunities for change and innovation in the industry and an exciting initiative to create a skills passport for a continued professional development for all in the industry. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Please like, share, comment and subscribe. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with John. John, welcome back to Integrated Infrastructure Podcast. Thanks ever so much for for joining us again. Thanks for having me, Paddy. Uh, Absolute pleasure. Um, Our first podcast was really talking about um, 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 Australian Contractors Associate Contractors Association um, and um, your recent sort of um, um, appointment there as CEO, and um, we talked around some of the the issues in the industry, and um, and you, you sort of um, telegraphed the, the fact that you were going to be working on a, a big plan um, coming forward, and um, and and we said we'd catch up after that. So that was really sort of what we what we're going to do. But um, for anybody who hasn't um, seen that podcast uh, and know anything about you, would you mind just introducing yourself again and and also ACA and telling us a bit about a, a bit about both? Yeah, sure. I mean, very briefly, I've, I've been around 30 years now in, in the construction game, uh, contracts and commercial background, working for major uh, contractors until fairly recently. Um, I was appointed to the role of CEO of the Queensland Major Contractors Association a few years back now. And uh, then along uh, came COVID and uh, an opportunity to uh, to try to influence uh, things for uh, better outcomes on a national stage through Australian Constructors Association, um, who are the association that look after um, the interests of of probably the major contractors in Australia, both from a civil infrastructure perspective, but also uh, a, a vertical commercial perspective as well. Brilliant. Actually, that leads us quite nicely into the new logo, doesn't it? The vertical and the horizontal infrastructure. It, it, it does, yeah. I mean, um, the, there is a great diagram that if you go onto our LinkedIn feed, you'll you'll find it down there that uh, the designer came up with, and we just thought, wow, you know, that, that that's just absolutely spot on. So you've got the mm. three sort of sectors of the industry that we look after being horizontal, um, civil infrastructure, vertical, and, and also construction services. But uh, we talk about the power of three, and within those three limbs, you can see three further. Um, uh, sectors to that which tie in with our three pillars of a sustainable industry which uh, no doubt I'll touch upon uh, shortly. Fantastic um, and you um, you wrote a, a, an article yesterday on LinkedIn which I think is doing, doing, doing rather well and getting quite a bit of traction and it's something that you mentioned previously in, in our first podcast which is about the um, 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 I think the, the question was is, is this the, the, the opportunity to, for the uberization of the construction industry in Australia um, can you give us an idea about what you what you meant by that, and um, um, and um, 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 you know what that looks like? Yeah, sure. So, so it's really looking at the industry and saying our, our industry hasn't substantially changed for the donkey's years. I mean, even if you look at how we construct roads, they're not we're not doing things substantially different from how the Romans built roads, um, which is which is a pretty sort of sad indictment on our industry, and. Governments are now relying on the construction industry to uh, lead the economy out of recession through the, uh, you know, the construction of uh, infrastructure and to, to leverage the social and economic benefits of that infrastructure. But the industry, the industry that they're calling on to do that is not in a good shape. Our industry mm-hmm. is not in a good shape. Um, particularly there's concerns around capability, capacity and skills, but not just from a contractor standpoint, but also from uh, from a client uh, standpoint as well. Um, 
So the pipeline of projects that are planned, really the only way that they are ever going to get built in the timeline that they, they want them to be built in is if we fundamentally change how um, we, we, we do things. Um, in particular, we need to, to try to find ways to, to collaborate more and to align um, outcomes um, so that we, we don't have the current situation where a contractor is incentivized to go off this way and, and a client wants to go off that way. Um, but if we do this, you know, there's benefits um, that can be achieved beyond just uh, capability, capacity and skills and getting these jobs done. If you look at things like digital engineering and, and lean construction, you know, the, these things have been around over 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And yet, that they haven't been taken up. And that's despite the fact that with BIM, studies have shown that over the life cycle of the asset, you can achieve savings of, of maybe 10%. And with, with lean construction, it's sort of, that's more focused on the actual construction period, but the savings are sort of 20 to 30%. And, and you go like, well, you know, given all those savings, why haven't they been taken up? Well, the reason is, that both of those concepts rely on open sharing of information and collaboration. And yet we've got contractual models that are set up that, that disincentivize that open sharing of information and that collaboration. So if we can address that, if we can have more collaborative frameworks, we provide a platform then for digital engineering and a platform for lean construction where we could see potentially significant improvements in productivity and cost saving. Mm. No, oh, fantastic. And and um, um, the you, there are some differences between the, the the world of taxes, aren't there, and, and construction in terms of the the client base and all that sort of stuff, as you pointed out as well. So it's, there's a, there's there's some challenges there. Yeah, I mean uh, the, the 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 analogy there with Uber, it, it probably doesn't bear too uh, uh, close an investigation because for sure they're they're, they're completely different. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is that that. The industry hasn't been disrupted in the way that the taxi mm. industry has been disrupted. We've long been sort of thinking about, well, where that, that can't continue. We can't continue on um, the, the way we have been. The industry will be disrupted at some stage. And a, a lot of people were thinking, well, where's that disruption going to come from? Is that going to be like an, an Elon Musk with his um, really boring company? Mm. Or what, what's that going to be? But I, I actually think rather than it being a person, rather than it being a company, that this is the opportunity that we have now with COVID because it is aligning the interests of all the different stakeholders within industry for the first time in, in a long, long time where we're all incentivized to improve and do better. And so mm -hmm. off the back of that, we can really, uh, if we can lock those changes in, this will be the significant disruption that we've all been expecting. Mm. I, I think in, in the past, if you're if the best that you can hope for on a project is a three percent um, profit, and the probability says you might not make any profit, and then actually the um, um, there's an additional risk there of trying BIM and trying lean construction because if you get it wrong, it could go even worse, you know, than you might be expecting. So that 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 relationship um, has to change, doesn't it? In in, in the, um, yeah, we, the, we, the the risk the risk taking to do something different. Yeah, we, we've got to move away from, I mean, the focus at the minute, to be quite frank, is just on staying alive. Con contractors, consultants, it, the, the focus is from project to project on staying alive. You make a loss on that job, you tender for the next job thinking, what have I got to do to win that, to make the money back that I've just lost on the last job? Mm. With that sort of mentality, is it any wonder that no one's focused on innovation, no one's focused on improving productivity, changing the culture of the industry, all of the things that we really need to do is just simply on staying alive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm not wanting to sort of j j jump ahead of ourselves because we're, we're touching on some things that um, I think are re really sort of um, um, important in your um, your framework for a sustainable future. So I've, I've, I've got it printed out here and um, you can find it on your website, can't you? Which is, um, just remind us again, your website. Uh, Constructors.com.au. Yeah, fantastic. Um, but the um, some of the statistics in your report are quite incredible in terms of the um, um, the situation that the industry has found itself in, sort of from a profitability point of view in the in the last sort of ten years, and particularly the last five years, aren't they? I mean, um, yeah, 
That, I mean, that, that, that's right, Paddy. I mean, there was a study done that uh, identified between 2000 and 2015 uh, that um, major contractors lost in the region of six billion dollars, and and you know the average sort of profitability was was negative. I can't remember now, 14, 15 percent. And the you know I'm, I'm sure given the the increase in uh, prevalence of mega projects and and the the increase in turnover that we, we're probably looking at from 2015 to now probably losses in the region of 10 uh, to 15 billion dollars. So, you know, that, I mean, that, that, that's just huge, but that, that's not the only startling figures. Um, we've got a diversity problem in the industry. We employ only 12% of our workforce overall um, is female. And it's if you look at blue collar, I, I think it's something like 3%. Um, mm. From a mental health perspe- perspective, our workers are six times more likely to um, die from, from suicide than they are from a workplace accident. Mm. And in terms of productivity, as I was talking about earlier, if you look at productivity growth over the last 30 years and compare construction to other industries, there's a 25% gap. Now, that if you convert that into an opportunity and say, well, look, if we could half that gap, what does that actually mean? What that actually means is that we could be constructing an extra $10 billion worth of projects every single year for the same amount of money and employing probably something in the region of 10,000 additional people. So, you know, that's a huge opportunity that we've, that we've got here. Mm, incredible. And, um, and, you know, we're talking about 10% of the country's GDP, uh, the, the industry, is that, and, and, and employing... Uh, have I got those that figures for the right? Right, oh, it, it, it's it, it's employing close to ten percent of the working right. population and uh, contributing around about. I mean, it fluctuates around about eight percent of GDP. So we, you mm. know, it's a, we're the third biggest industry in in Australia. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. So um, we've talked then about some of those issues there in terms of um, um, profitability, profitability um, um, mental health and attraction and retention and things like that. Um, um, also, there's the, the, the boom and bust that you've talked about before as well. Just just talk us a little bit through that because that's I, I, I think particularly in 2020 where um, everybody has felt a serious lag in the work that's supposed to have been coming through. Um, it feels even more more sort of important today than it has done in the last sort of five years for sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we anyone who's been in the industry for any length of time has experienced this sort of boom and bust cycle, um, and it's largely driven by politics and and, and and election cycles. I mean, here in Queensland, we um, last year um, had a significant shortfall of work, and yet now. Funnily enough, in the six months before the election, all of these projects come come out and start getting awarded. So politics is a major problem, but we need to understand what what why is it a problem having these peaks and troughs? It's all about planning. It's it's all all about investing in the future. If, if you don't know what the if it, with a reasonable level of confidence what the future is going to be, again, that impacts on your willingness to invest in the future. And peaks are just as bad as troughs. So with, with peaks, we have less uh, less productivity. Um, we're all trying to do more with with, with less um, uh, with less work less less workforce. And then, you know you think, well, okay, well that sounds like it should be more productive. But you're using people that aren't necessarily the right people for the right job because you're trying to find the, uh, get enough people together to to do the work. Mm-hmm. Um, so. When we talk about, uh, when we talk quite a bit about the importance of pipelines and, and pr- pipeline visibility, and, and uh, we sort of commented recently around the INSW scorecard and, and the fact that rightly so, um, that they've marked themselves highly on that and say, look, you know, isn't it, you know, we're doing a great job now with, with the visibility on the pipeline. Fine, but that's just stage one with the pipeline. Why is the pipeline important and the visibility of the pipeline important? Because once you've got that, you can see the peaks and troughs coming. And therefore, it gives you an opportunity to do something about it. So it just shouldn't just be a case of, right, we've got great visibility here and we can see this huge, great peak coming up. The question then is, or the opportunity then is to say, well, what can we do to to flatten that off? Is there an opportunity to push some of that out, bring some of it forward, to give a greater consistency of workload? And I don't think that any government 
here, um, both uh, state level or, or nationally, is doing a good enough, anywhere near a good enough job in that area. Mm. Flatten the curve. Flatten the curve. <laughs> twenty twenty. <laughs> no, you're quite right, and and um, it's something that you know I've, that frustrates me, and I've talked to other people about it recently. Is that the um, the degree? To, you know, I started recruiting twenty years ago, and there were some uh, you know in the UK. I don't know bore people with that, but there were some incredible brands back then, and incredible companies that had. Um, 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 they viewed in employees as investments and long-term investments, you know, properly long-term investments. They put a lot of money into people. Um, and, and, and nowadays, and I think that existed here as well with the John Hollands and the Leightons and, um, and Abbey groups and Balderstones and what have you. But um, and nowadays, I think people, people um, whatever level they are, um, are far more seen as labor than um, employees. Um, you know, even highly technical people, very senior people are still, um, the, the, the length of times that people are on CV, uh, you know, on a job or in a company, it's just, it's just gone like that over the last 10 years. It's crazy. Um, yeah, that's, that's right. And, and there's something that we're looking at as ACA in terms of from, from a capability and capacity perspective. If we have that, that, that transience and, and maybe we're not going to ever go back to those days um, again, um, and if we're not, how, how do we ensure that our people are appropriately trained if they're only going mm. to be on the project for on, on a project before moving off onto some another project. So, I think as an industry, we we need to do something there to ensure that collectively now that we provide an alternate to that sort of old system of bringing people through and providing that sort of call it maybe a skills passport or whatever it is, yeah. identifying the skills that are necessary for people to to make the move up. Um, up the career ladder and then providing some sort of mechanism for recording that and 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 encouraging uh, and providing those opportunities for that learning and development yeah that's a great idea i mean somebody, somebody like the um, institute of civil engineers would be very good at that um, um internationally or um, um uh, the chartered institute of quantity surveyors are very good at that sort of thing but um i think that would be a great idea if, if people Ooh. knew that they were they had a, that, that skills passport as you've quite rightly said and, and that they were going to get that um that development wherever they were working um they, they there was there was still that cpd um you know uh, continual professional development sort of opportunities all the way through their career well, we we are actually already starting that process with Engineers Australia to develop mm. a competency framework for engineers. So taking yeah. that through, you come out of uni, uni, graduate engineer, a section engineer, project engineer, project manager, project director. What what are the the agreed level of skills and competencies to that, that as an industry we we think are necessary to make that jump, and then. Once you've got that competency framework, then we can start putting together training module, modules that will help people uh, fill in any gaps that they have to make that, that, that next career progression. That's brilliant. I think that's really good. Um, and I think that would make a, make a, a, a big difference to uh, you know, assessing skills and maintaining skills and developing people long term. So that's exciting. I'd love to you know, hear about more about that when that, when that comes along. Um, so uh, it's not all doom and gloom. It's easy to rest on those things. We don't really want to do that for too long because you've actually um, um, you know, put, put together this framework that I think is very positive. And um, in, you know, there's lots of discussions going on in the industry um, about various points, but you've managed to pull, pull them all together. Um, so um, what about starting with the three pillars? Um, can you talk to us about, about those? Yeah, so through through a long period of time, and especially with, with the work that we've done with the Construction Industry Leadership Forum and the Construction Industry Culture Task Force, we we very much aligned on the fact that the, there are three key pillars that are required for a sustainable construction industry, and they are an improved industry culture, uh, addressing and improving capability, capacity, and skills, mm-hmm. and utilizing equitable and aligned commercial frameworks. And all of those three are interlinked. You can't just focus on, if you want a sustainable construction industry, you can't just focus on one and not the other two. And and I guess the best example of how to demonstrate that is if you look at the commercial frameworks that we have been operating with for the last 10 years or so, they're driving very adversarial outcomes and adversarial culture. And what that is doing is impacting on our ability to attract and retain the people that we need to into the industry because everyone says you know why, why would i want to come and 
work in an industry where I'm, I'm coming to have a, a blue every day. Um, mm-hmm. And that's quite sort of understandable. So the three key pillars are interlinked. And, and we also say that uh, in, in the model that we've d- derived, and, and again, people can find this on our, on our website, um, but it sits on a platform. It, it needs a found those three key pillars. You can obviously detect a bit of a, a construction theme here, the three, kilo, three key pillars in the foundation. Um, the, the foundation is built up of accountability, that we, that we are accountable for what we do, mm-hmm. improved collaboration, um, social license, improved social license, and coming back to your point around the pipeline of works, an, an economic pipeline of works, a, a stable and uh, economic pipeline works across all sectors, three sectors of our industry, and across also um, the length and breadth of the industry so that we, uh, it's not just a focus from our perspective on um, the bigger projects because that's who we are, that's what we do. For a healthy industry, you need a sustainable pipeline of work for all levels within industry. Absolutely. what sort of traction are you getting with this, John? How how how's it how's it being received? And um, um, uh, you know, I think we talked about that the the next stage is getting it implemented, isn't it? And you know, that, driving that the, driving that change. That's the trick. <laughs> that's the trick. You know, there's it, it's interesting because that there are a lot of reform initiatives out there, and I've, I've been having a lot of conversations with with my colleagues in other industry associations and. I talk about this sort of Venn diagram. If, if you took all of our key focus areas and our initiatives and you put them on a Venn diagram, you'd have this huge great area of overlap in the middle, this huge great splodge where we all, we all agree. And, and I think the key for us is to, is to come together more uh, and be more united in, in that position. But the other key for, for me is, and, and the missing ingredient um, in terms of previous reform initiatives is, is the need for the federal government to get more involved because ultimately, yes, the states, they, they are responsible for delivering these projects, but the money comes from the Commonwealth. Mm. And the Commonwealth has this interest, as I said earlier, they, they have, they're relying on the industry to, um, from an economy point of view, to lead us out of recession there's concerns, capability, capacity, and skills. They want to leverage outcomes. Um, but they also want to improve productivity because ultimately, yes, we're, we're, we're maxing out the credit card at the moment to build all this infrastructure. And you go, well, fine. You know, that's, uh, that, that, that's worthy and, and probably the right thing to do. But you can, that's not sustainable in the long term. And the requirement to build infrastructure never stops. If the economy is to remain competitive, we have to keep building new infrastructure. So really, um, we've got to find a way to build more for less. So this comes back to this opportunity, the COVID opportunity. It's governments at all levels really need to work with industry to address those particular issues. But for us, the missing link is the involvement of the federal government and, and how they can incentivize reform at the AFR Infrastructure Summit a couple of weeks ago, someone mentioned that uh, as an idea, you know, you take the asset recycling um, incentivization and, okay, well, asset recycling is very controversial and it only worked, uh, that that program worked in um, mainly, I think, New South Wales was probably yeah. the principal beneficiary of that. But, you know, you take the same concept where you, as a federal government, you're incentivizing behaviours and outcomes that you're trying to achieve. And that could be um, saying that uh, future funding or or you could put up uh, additional funding for additional projects, providing that um, the the way that they were um, procured and delivered met certain standards. And this is really where I see IA, uh, Infrastructure Australia, coming in because Mm -hmm. they're just working on their update at the their infrastructure plan that was last uh, uh, produced in 2016. And that talks about best practice um, for uh, and sets out best practice for infrastructure delivery. So I think there's a really good opportunity and the timing is good to to look at. And we've had some very positive discussions with uh, with Infrastructure Australia, uh, Romilly and Peter over there, some Mm. excellent conversations. They're, they're, They're very keen to engage 
with industry and to, to look at how that, that potentially could be achieved. And one of the things that we're sort of talking about is the Construction Industry Leadership Forum, which is a grouping of ourselves, the New South Wales mm. government and the Victorian government, uh, expanding that, um, uh, that initiative to, to take in more jurisdictions and more stakeholders as well, so that it could potentially become, for example, an, like a national uh, body uh, reform initiative. So there's some really good conversations happening at the moment. Um, but what we need to do is we need to pull those initiatives together and, and start to get some runs on the board. I mean, the, the, from a state-based perspective, the, there are some really interesting state initiatives that, that, that are happening at the moment. Um, we have um, the Victoria, uh, the, there's a MTIA uh, Department of uh, Treasury and Finance initiative that they're looking at uh, mm. from a point of view procurement of mega projects and INSW are, are, are looking at a, um, a, an, a reform initiative as well. So there's a lot of really good stuff happening. The only concern there would be really we need to be trying to bring this together in some way. Yeah, it's it's um, you look at all of this and, um, you know, so 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 um, often we, we find ourselves talking about industry, don't we? We talk about the industry and we talk about civil engineering and building. And um, um, I think I, I think I mentioned um, before the call, I, was, I had a chat with Alison Mirrams yesterday and, um, you know, she 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 made the point that. Um, you know, we're so focused on, um, you know, we're, well, we are very focused on, um, you know, um, this is an extreme example, um, but um, modern slavery and, and the fact that people in other countries would work under very bad circumstances, 80 hours a week, um, stressful circumstances and what have you. Um, but actually, some of that is very, is very much happening in, in Australia here. But we, we you know, we're, we're concerned where our coffee comes from, but not necessarily about the junior people out on site working six days a week, 12 hours a day sort of thing. Um, and it, it's, it's almost like we need to put the, put the person back in, in infrastructure and, 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 and building and put the people back in and remember that, the, um, that, that us, the individuals and people, are, are not just um, the people working in the industry, but with the clients as well. And, and it's it, we talk about federal money, but actually it's our money um, because we're all going to pay for it at the end of the day, aren't we? Um, it, it, and it, it's putting the per, putting the individual and 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 the community at the centre of, of of all of that. Yeah, it, it is, and that's why culture is one of the three key pillars uh, for mm. a sustainable industry. It, a lot of this is is a cultural thing where you know we talk about you know the the acceptance of working and acceptance of working ten hours a day more. The acceptance of doing a, um, a tender for a project over Christmas, you know these 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 stupid things that we 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 can do something about this, and we and we should do. We're going to have to do something about this because the reality is that, and I, I think I might have mentioned this last time um, we spoke. Um, the difference that we have now between you know when, when I came out into industry many many moons ago. And you, you, you made you call as to which what you were going to do. For me, I, I, I did a degree in quantity surveying, came out into that sort of field. And, you know, you get sent out to, I remember getting sent, one of my first projects was, uh, was up on the Pennines in the UK in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it was the only project where they handed out free issue balaclavas and gloves because it was that bloody cold. <laughs> and, um, and, and now some, some people may go, you know what, shit, this isn't for me. But... You, you, back in, in, in those days, you, you made a decision, that was it, and, and 99 times out of 100, you, you put up with it and got on with it. But mm. what we have now, um, we, we have, and rightfully so, we, we have a new generation that, that's not prepared to put up with that. They, you know, they, they do a degree in engineering, come out, get sent to a donger in the middle of nowhere and um, working 12 hours a day and go, well, actually, this is a bit crap. I'm going to retrain and become an accountant. And mm. off do uh, off they do so we if we are going to attract and retain the people that we need to in our industry um we have to change how we operate yeah absolutely and and um we are seeing young people who have been out on site two three four five years coming to us now looking to change direction this year in particular it's, it's been really interesting so I, I think um um there is um there's de you know this is this is the time to change isn't it this is an opportunity to change um the budget um the, the last budget which we were all waiting so desperately for was very much about pumping the sort of the the finances up getting the get, getting the economy going um 
but we know there's lots of structural work, not just in construction and engineering, but around um, other other parts of the economy, um, particularly around women um, and, and supporting them in the workforce. Um, so, um, you know, the, the government's done brilliantly through COVID, haven't they? Um, some of the state governments and, and and certainly sort of a federal level, the budget was was as, as you know um, primarily a success so you know so far. Um, but this big structural change has to happen, um, not just in, in in our industry but but elsewhere as well. So um, now is the time for the Uberization of infrastructure, isn't it? For sure. Oh, no, no, now's the time for change. I, I, yeah. Absolutely. And to pick up your point around, you know, that, that that coming back to diversity again, you can link diversity cap- to capability, capacity and skills. You know, we, we have mm. a capability, capacity and skills problem. And yet, you know, we, we are missing out on half the working population currently um, because of the, the practices and the working conditions and, and all the other stuff that we have that uh, is, is, is making us not a career destination of choice for, for, for women. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would encourage anybody who's interested in this stuff and wants to um, um, find out more about you is to, to, to get on and read the framework for a sustainable future. And I know that you've put in a lot of work into this and, and it resonates with all the conversations that I have with people on the podcast and, and elsewhere. Um, so, um, you know, all power to you in, you know, um, um, in making these changes. And I'm, I'm really excited to see, you know, see, see what, you, what you're doing and I'm sure everybody else is as well. So, um, obviously wishing you the, the very best of luck with that. Um, we are a short form podcast, even though we know, I mean, we always end up saying that and then end up sort of talking longer than we expect to. Um, but, um, um, we always finish with the question, what are you excited about? So I think, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot and because we're talking about, we, we know what you're excited about. We're excited about infrastructure. Um, but tell us something outside infrastructure. What, you know, coming towards the end of 2020, you know, We've had COVID. We've lost Sean Connery. It's been a terrible year. Um, what are you excited about? Well, well, funny you should mention Sean Connery, Paddy. I'm actually excited to see the new James Bond film when it finally comes out. Great um, answer. <laughs> I'm also excited about the fact that uh, my my hometown football club, Middlesbrough, finally have a chance at promotion to the Premier League under a new manager. So that's another thing I'm excited about. But very good. Uh, Jokes aside, I, I'm really excited about the the, the borders reopening again, mm. hopefully sometime soon. And really, uh, I mean, I, I I've come into this role. I started in this role first of July, and I'm I'm so over meeting people via a video screen. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's there's so many people that I've met um, since taking on this role um, th- this way because that's the only way to meet the people. But uh, I'm really, really keen to catch up with people in person because I think there's no um, alternative to the quality that you get of, of, of meeting out with someone and having a coffee and having a good uh, good yarn. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to those pre-Christmas catch-ups, you know, um, um, you know, Breaking down the year face to face with a with a with a you know hopefully a beer in your hand and uh, yeah, enjoying that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it should be a beer <laughs> uh, and some and some cricket as well would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, John, thanks ever so much for coming on again. I really appreciate it. Um, um, I re- you know really excited about um, you know what you're doing and your plans. And um, it's always great to to have you on and to and to chat. So thanks ever so much. And um, I'll look forward to talking to you soon. I hope. No, I really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, for those that haven't read my Uber article, please uh, jump on and uh, <laughs> like and share it. Don't worry, we'll reference it in the in the show notes for sure. Excellent, thanks. Excellent. Have a good day, John. Speak to you Cheers. soon. Cheers. Integrated Infrastructure is powered by North Search, specialists in executive and technical search across engineering, design, construction, property and energy markets in Australia. If you'd like to find out more about North Search or get involved with this podcast, you can click on the links in the show notes or email me directly at the address on the screen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Integrated Infrastructure. Please tell your friends and colleagues if you did, and we hope to see you again soon.